Hi, everyone, and welcome to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and welcome to the show where we dig deeper to understand what really matters most in business. If you're watching this, you'll see I've got a guest in studio today. It's always great to have someone sitting next to me. And today, the person sitting next to me is Scott Shaw, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Lincoln Tech. Scott, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Hi, Dave. It's nice to be here, that's uh, for sure. It's a pleasure to have you here, physically in studio. Uh, yes. Most of my guests are zooming in from around the world, so it's great to have somebody sitting next to me. Good. For, for folks who may not know about Lincoln Tech, why don't you tell them a little bit about what you do? Sure. Uh, Lincoln Tech's been around for 75 years and we're a vocational training organization. We help individuals get that first job and we focus on three key areas. Uh, uh, transportation is one, so we teach people to be auto mechanics, diesel mechanics, collision repair. Uh, skilled trades is another area where about a third of our students uh, reside. And they're learning to be electricians, HVAC techs, welders, and CNC machinists. And then about a third of our students are in healthcare with LPN and medical assisting being the largest programs. And all of our programs are designed to be done in an accelerated format because our students want to get in and get out and get a job as quickly as possible. And yeah. so that's what we offer our students. Yeah, and it, it seems to me that you're offering a unique solution, especially given the circumstances and the times we're in right now, right? Yes. We've got a labor shortage. Um, as I understand, there's also a skills gap. Yep. Uh, talk a little bit about that in, sure. in terms of the overall environment and how it's setting the stage for what you do. Yes. So obviously there have always been vocational schools out there and vocational um, careers, but I think during COVID everyone realized that there really are, these are essential careers and that's what the government calls them, calls them now. Unfortunately though, we as a country and, and as a society have been wanting to push more and more people to go to college and this really kind of started back in the 1980s. And in order to help people get to college, we started cutting out a lot of the VOTEC programs, frankly, from our high schools, so students could have more time to do academics to help them get into college. Well, what that has done is created this skills gap that you mentioned earlier, because now we have two generations of students who have never been exposed to working with their hands. So they don't know what the jobs are, frankly, to even think about them. And they don't know if they really have an aptitude in something that could, they could really excel in. And now as people like myself and you, probably baby boomers are retiring, uh, there's now this shortage of workers out there because again, these people haven't been introduced to these careers, they're not as familiar with it. Students spend a lot more time at home on their computers. You're not in the backyard with your father or mother working on a car. And so as these, the need for these careers has maintained, if not increased, uh, the number of people getting into them has shrunk and that's what's causing this issue. Yeah, and like, like you said, we're taught or we're suggested that we should be going to college. Yes. And look, college isn't for everyone. I'm, yep. a, I'm a big proponent of doing the college education, yep. but it's not for everyone. And what I've seen personally is folks changing majors, uh, taking way longer than the four years that we were told it's going to take and that we'd be paying for. Right. Uh, and then, or even worse, when they do graduate, they're graduating with a major that, dare I say, useless in the real world. Right. Talk a little bit about how you can offer them maybe a, a different solution then if college may be not the right thing for them necessarily. Right. So the economy definitely needs more people with a college degree, but they just doesn't need everyone with a college degree. So if you look at it a broad s spectrum, about 30% of the jobs that are out there require a bachelor's degree or higher. About 50% of the jobs, though, require something more than a high school degree, but less than a bachelor's degree, and that's kind of where we fall in. And then about 20% of the jobs that are there uh, require no kind of uh, education past high school. Now, the challenge is those jobs are shrinking in our economy, so if you don't have any kind of post-secondary education, it's going to become more and more difficult for you to get a job. And it is increasing the number of jobs that require a bachelor's degree. But again, it's still a relatively smaller portion of the, our economy. And so with the thought of trying to push everyone to go to college, again, we're kind of neglecting that biggest group, which is the post high school less than bachelor's degree offering. And those are usually cheaper, faster ways to, to get into the workforce. And with college being online now, you can always go back to college when you really know what you want to do. You, you, you mentioned the issue that it now takes students at least like six years to get through college and, and the graduation rate for traditional bachelor's programs is about 60% after six years. And that's because people are changing their minds. They're not sure what they want to do because we've kind of forced everyone into college whether they're ready for it or not. 
And I would just, you know, encourage people to, you know, think about it, take some time off, do something else, uh, because the opportunity to go to college is now, uh, you know, you can do it at any time, frankly, in your life. Yeah. Are the high schools promoting the, uh, the VOTEC education as an alternative? Uh, no, I would say. I mean, most high schools, as I mentioned earlier, are striving for ac higher academics. Many of them get, I'll say, somewhat graded on what percent of their students go on to college. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a, a badge of honor. Yeah. Certainly, if you're looking for buying a new house in a new community, it's one of the first questions a lot of new homeowners ask. What's the percent of uh, students from the local high school going to college? So we have this mindset that's kind of perpetuating this challenge. Now, the good news is, or bad news, college is so expensive, people are looking for alternatives. And so again, a, a shorter vocational program could be that alternative that just, you know, frankly, better matches up with your son or daughter uh, at this stage in their life. Yeah, you said something at the opening about uh, how we're not used to being out in the back working mm -hmm. on cars with our parents and, and how students aren't familiar with these other types of roles. And I've seen that firsthand in talking with a number of younger employees and coming through the workforce, graduating from, from high school. And their proclivity is to think, well, if college isn't for me, you know, I'll enter the workforce maybe in retail mm -hmm. and, and try and pick up some skills there. And if you mention the idea of doing something, getting trained to be a mechanic or an electrician right. or some of the, the, the Votech things, their, their instinct is no. Yeah. Why do they quiver when, when they hear that? Well, again, there's probably been this negative stigmatism that we've created, whether directly or indirectly. And, you know, parents, you know, I'm a parent, I have four children. You know, when you're out talking with your friends, you know, everyone's asking, you know, where's your son or daughter going to college? And if you don't say that they're going to college, people always kind of somewhat look at you. So again, as a society, we've really kind of pushed away from it. Yet at the same time, we all acknowledge that, boy, I wish, you know, I sent my kids to become a plumber or something else. Because when you pay that bill, you realize this is a really solid career that people are making really good money. And so you kind of think, well, why did I maybe misdirect my child to not go into that field? And with any field, I mean, we have auto mechanics. After you've been there eight years and become a master mechanic, you're going to be making six figures. So you literally could be 30 years old without a college education in a very solid career, making six figures, and I don't think any parent would be adverse to that. No, I mean, it sounds like a great alternative for those who are in need of it or looking yep. for it. Uh, tell me what you guys are doing in terms of creating more awareness around this, because I know that there are a lot of folks who are watching and listening who probably were thinking, man, I wish I knew about this a couple of years ago. Yeah, and, and that's... That's one of the things we hear a lot from our students. And our students tend to be older. The average age is around 26 or 27 because they've gone down a certain path in their life. They might, may have done retail. They may have worked in a restaurant or hospitality uh, just because those are relatively easy jobs to get without a skill. But then they realize that's not going to help them uh, continue to grow or be able to support their families and then they come back to us to get that career. So we are out there marketing frankly a lot. I mean everyone knows that there's a shortage out there but still people don't understand what these careers are about, what the job entails. Um, they might not even know what the job is. We have a great program called CNC machining or advanced manufacturing and people think of manufacturing and their minds might go to a, you know dark dirty assembly lines with doing some sort of repetitive task. Whereas in, in this case, you're uh, programming a $50,000, $150,000 machine to do a task and then going to another machine to do the, uh, program it to do a, a different task. And you could be living in it, oh, not living, sorry, you could be working in a very clean environment. So it's a, it, that's air conditioned. That's very different than people's perceptions. You're using your mind as well as your hands. But again, if I say you, you want to become a CNC machinist, you know, very few people are ever going to know what that is. So we do try to educate people, uh, both to drive them to our website. We do have high school guidance counselors, uh, admissions folks that go around to high schools mm -hmm. to educate students about what these opportunities are. Uh, again, w we provide a really good service to a lot of industries because people just think that 
individuals are naturally flocking to all these professions, and unfortunately they aren't. And so we have to educate people, and that's part of what, one of the values, frankly, we bring to the community when we open a school in that area, because we need to attract enough students to make that a viable institution, and that helps get the word out and support all those local businesses that are dependent on these technicians. Yeah, and when you talk about you know, not getting your hands dirty, working in a clean environment, I, I think that that's, you're busting a myth right there, Scott. Yes. That when you think of a, a Votech career, um, it's, it's the, the machine shop, the mechanic, things like that. Yep. But healthcare, for example, yes. is, is a growing field. It, it's probably an area that's going to be continuing to grow in terms of the demand and the need for people. And that's an area where you help, too, yes. right? Yes. Hey, and we're seeing increased demand. And frankly, I thought maybe during COVID it would kind of scare people away because you heard so much about people in hospitals can, uh, contracting COVID and other s situations. But truly, the people that go into healthcare do want to help people, and they have that frankly just kind of built within them. So COVID actually has encouraged more people to go into healthcare. And so uh, there's obviously an aging population. So there's naturally more need for healthcare in our country and our society going forward. Obviously the pandemic has also raised the awareness of the, some of the shortages that are out there and therefore we need more people to go into this field so that we can have less uh, anxiety around uh, COVID or other matters that come around. And so we are trying to expand our healthcare offerings uh, today. Uh, we're headquartered in New Jersey. We have six campuses in New Jersey, and we're the largest provider of LPNs in the state. And in the state of New Jersey, the LPNs are mainly going to work into assisted living in situations like that. And literally half of all the new LPNs are coming out of our schools. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, what, not, what next can we do? And so now we're looking to hopefully uh, eventually offer RN, which is the largest yeah. field within the healthcare sector. And you hear about it in the news almost Almost every day the acute shortage uh, that we have out there for nurses. Oh yeah, for sure. That's definitely a real thing. Uh, Scott, before we uh, take a quick pause here for commercial break, tell the audience about some of the other states that you're in and how they sure. can connect with you or learn more about Lincoln Tech if they've got a student or if they are a student and want to learn more. Great. Yeah, so we're in 14 different states. We basically cover from Washington, D.C. up to Boston, but we're also uh, out in Indianapolis. We're in Nashville, Chicago. We're in Dallas, Denver. We have a, a school in Las Vegas and one down in Atlanta. Uh, you can go to lincolntech.com to learn more about it. Uh, you can always reach me at ask S. Shaw, so Scott Shaw at lincolntech.edu. And uh, on that website that you go to, you'll hear from our students, you'll hear from employers. There'll be a description of what the careers are, what the average salaries are. It's a good way to learn about some, something that you may not be familiar with, but have some sort of idea about. Yeah, great. Thank you for sharing that. And I think that's a great spot for us to take a quick pause here. We do have to pay a few bills. So, uh, Scott, you sit right there. Sure. You're watching and listening. Don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Hi, I'm Bob Hokertle from Kings Road Brewing Company. I'm here to tell you about a brand new show on RVN television called Cooking with the King. Each week, we're going to taste and sample some of the best beer the Kings Road Brewing Company has to offer. And we're going to talk to area chefs and restaurant owners as we pair our beer with their signature dishes. We're going to teach you how to cook and eat like a king. Cheers. A stroke can be easy to detect. A loved one can't speak, perhaps they can't move. But there's another sign of a stroke that many of us can't see. It's called spatial neglect, and it can occur during or after a stroke, causing distorted visual movements. Fortunately, there's a solution by using optical prism technology during rehabilitation. If you or a loved one have experienced a stroke, ask your doctor about spatial neglect. Spatial neglect. See the whole picture at KesslerFoundation.org. Are you burned out? disenfranchised, disengaged, extremely distracted? Do you feel that you're lost in semantics, over leveraged, overwhelmed? My name is Lisa Fratelli, and I have a show on RVN TV, always streaming. The name of the show is The Neuroscience of Wealth and Wellbeing. The intention of this show is to explain how you can get back to homeostasis, flow states, creativity, 
it's highly correlated with happiness and well-being. So you can get out of overwhelm, get out of burnout, not feel distracted, and get back to your life. You will hear from experts who will get you back on track so you can enjoy your life again. RVN TV, we're always streaming. Are you part of the great resignation? Are you a business owner that would like to diversify your business holdings? Have you always had an entrepreneurial itch but did not have a concept to get you started? Milestone Franchising represents over 500 franchise concepts across 30 industries. Concepts range from $20,000 to $6 million, and they can be home-based, office-based, mobile, or brick and mortar. We guide you through the process to select which concept is best for you based upon your core competencies, your interests, and your financials. Milestone Franchising is part of the International Franchise Professionals Group, IFPG, and will bring a host of resources to assist you in your quest for business ownership. When you work with a certified franchise consultant, you gain access to a professional process that helps you succeed in your search for the right placement. Finding the best placement for you within the franchising world of 4,000 concepts is the objective. Matching your skills and goals with a culture that fits you best is the priority. For a free consultation, visit our website at milestonefranchising.com. Milestone Franchising is here to lead you in a new direction. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today sitting next to me is Scott Shaw, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lincoln Tech. Scott, welcome back to the second round here on Behind the Numbers. Uh, good conversation in the first segment, and as we were talking during the intermission here, I, I want to kick this segment off by, dare I even say, a compare and contrast between what you're offering in college, because I know folks who are watching and listening may be very keen to understand some of the statistics and, and more detail in the background. So. Some of the things that came to my mind as a parent, first thing I would want to know is who, who's teaching the curriculum? Sure. So we are different than a lot of traditional schools. We are all about getting people jobs. And to do that, we have experts that are teaching the students. So all of our students, I'm sorry, all of our faculty members have at least three to five years minimum job experience. So they're coming to us as practitioners in the field, and then we give them the skills to become teachers. And the whole objective there is to make sure that the curriculum is directly tied to what the employers want and in, in what an individual needs to be successful. And then, when, then we supplement that with every six months, we bring in uh, employers that have hired our students to critique us on, okay, uh, what shortages do the students have? What should we continue to in, uh, reinforce? Where's the industry going? What should we be adding to our curriculum to make sure that these students, when they go to you, really have the skills that you want? So it's a very different, very practical, hands-on approach that we have in order to hopefully give the students that leg up on other individuals. Moreover, our program is designed, as I said earlier, to get in and get out as quickly as possible. So we have no spring break, we have no winter break. Students are coming to us almost like they're coming to a job so that within a year's worth of schooling at Lincoln is really equal to more than two years of schooling at a traditional college because the students don't want to waste that time. They want to get in and get out. And as a result, uh, the students uh, are able to uh, retain what we've taught them. Uh, we're giving them hands-on education. Um, and, that, and that's another part. You know, certainly at college, you might do a lab or, or something of that nature, but you're always in the lab at a Lincoln Tech School because you're learning what the concept is, but then you need to apply it immediately. And so many of our students really that resonates better with them as they're hands-on learning learners and they want to do something with their hands they want to fix something that's one of the things that's uh, brought them to Lincoln so th those are uh, two of the areas that are were different kind of an accelerated pace that you go through and all of our faculty members are truly uh, people that just haven't read it in a book but actually have done the job yeah I, I think I heard you say that you're working with companies to help better define the curriculum. Yes. Talk a little bit about that because I think that's a point that's worth emphasizing. Yeah, because obviously things change over time and new technologies come into, into play and 
obviously I mentioned earlier we're in the automotive field, so electric vehicles are becoming more and more popular. Still a very tiny percent of the cars that are sold, but more dealers are starting to ask us to prepare the students to work on electric vehicles. And so we're figuring out what we need to add to our curriculum. And the two biggest things that we've learned uh, that you might not be thinking about, but first is safety, because with an electric vehicle, there's a lot of power. And unlike yeah. a traditional car, if you touch the wrong wire or cut the wrong thing, you actually could get electrocuted. So we have to teach our, our students how to deal with that, as well as how to not to damage the battery, because that's the most ex expensive part. But every industry has something that's changing, whether it's HVAC technology, or being an electrician, learning how to install solar panels, or trying to figure out what next is going to be prevalent within that community. What, what do the employers need? And it just gives our students, we believe, an edge, in, uh, certainly compared to the competition, because they have the skills that the employers want. Yeah, one of the things I jotted down here is you said that the, the goal of the students when they come to you is to get a job. Yes. And when folks are going to college, they're thinking the same thing, and there are no guarantees in the world. Yep. But what's been your, uh, dare I say, success rate, yep. placement rate, in, in terms of getting folks into jobs? Surely. Yeah, so again, we're very focused on that. So we track it. We have teams of people at every campus. We run career fairs. And we've been averaging over 80% placement in the field of study. So that means if we trained you to become an auto mechanic, you're getting a job as an auto mechanic. We're not counting you, you graduated from us and went to work at Walmart or something else. Yeah. Uh, it's a job in the field. And for that, we have over 80% placement. Uh, frankly, we have so many opportunities and there's no reason why it shouldn't be 100%, but certain students, for whatever reason, don't want to move or, or go to a certain job for, a, for, their, for their own personal reasons. But I can, I can tell you, we have more job opportunities out there than we have students. Gotcha. Last thing as a parent that would come to mind is tuition. Yes. Uh, do you guys offer any kind of assistance with tuition? We do. We, we have scholarships, uh, and obviously we are accredited, so that means that students can access Title IV funds. Uh, if you uh, uh, have lower income, you can get Pell Grants, so that's free money from the government that you don't have to uh, repay. Uh, just to put it in perspective, we charge roughly about $22 an hour for the education and our average student leaves with about $13,000 worth of debt. You know, a large number, but not as large as a lot of the numbers that you hear out there for students graduating from a post-secondary institution. Got it. Uh, are you okay if I shift gears a little bit and talk about your role as CEO? Sure, T no problem. Tell us how many employees you have. We have around 2,000 employees. We have 22 campuses around the country. About half of our employees are our instructors, and the rest are split up between the, the uh, admissions advisors, financial aid, uh, career services people, business office people, and, and the like. Um, and we've been growing, which is a good thing for all businesses. Uh, so that's nice, and we'll be opening up our first new campus in Atlanta uh, next year, which we haven't opened a new campus in over a decade. So that's exciting for us as well. Yeah, I'm always fascinated to talk to business leaders about how they made it through the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, what were the aha moments? What were the lessons learned? What, what are we now doing differently? Can you yeah. share any of that with us? Sure. I mean, it was truly transformational and pleasantly surprising because as I've probably described, we're very much a hands-on training institution. And when the government told us we had to shut down and not have anyone in our schools, we were trying to think like, what are we going to do? But I give our team, and that means everyone at corporate and at the campuses, a lot of credit because our mindset as an organization is how do we serve our students? And the environment changed, and we knew that so many of our students want to continue their education because their goal is, again, to get that job, to go out there and support their family. So what could we do to keep them on track? And our organization, frankly, rallied. And I can't say it was because of me. I can say it's just because of who our employees are and their need or demand or their, their desire to help our students, as well as keep the company as healthy as possible. So we moved from 100% hands-on to 100% uh, online, but w that was only for a three-month period. As soon as a state allowed us to reopen our campuses, we did. And so we are, our first campus was reopened by June, and our last campus that opened was in August in New York City. But during that period of time, we still had to operate 
with distance. We had to schedule students so that there wouldn't be too many in a class at a time. But again, we learned a lot, and we learned that our students are not afraid of online education. They still love the hands-on, but we do teach them a lot of theory so they can understand what they're doing, and all that theory can really be taught online. So we're now changing our curriculum to have some about 25% blended, which means students can uh, not come to our campuses as long. They can work longer in their jobs or reduce their childcare needs to come to us. We also learn that we can do a lot more things uh, over the phone or through the computer, whether it's enrolling or helping them get through the financial aid process. So all these new uh, remote services that we had to do we're now incorporating into our day-to-day -day operations and we think we'll end up with a kind of the best of both worlds all the hands-on training that we've always done but with some blended learning to give the students greater flexibility in the future yeah and as CEO you've got a lot of constituents that you've got to keep happy and yes. keep in line including investors yes how, how do you balance all of the roles and responsibilities in terms of keeping investors happy and informed and managing a workforce, especially as you're going through a pandemic? Yeah. Well, uh, again, uh, the good news about the pandemic is that everyone was going through it. Yeah. So people could relate to what we were doing. And in many regards, the fact that we performed better than many of our peers actually ended up being a good thing for me in, in my investors. So that was, frankly, an easy part of, of the whole process. The more difficult part has been just the emotional toll it's really taken on the employees. It's been very stressful. Uh, it was AR employees had to do a lot more uh, at work, but they also had their own lives. Again, just like a lot of other people, when the schools were shut down, uh, we had employees obviously with children. And how do you decide where you're gonna allocate your time between taking care of your children or, or your job? Uh, we have you know, lots of people with, you know, elderly people that were sick during COVID or family members who got sick. So it did add a, a lot of stress. And so we tried to be as understanding, tried to make a work as, I'll say, enjoyable a, a, as possible. Yeah. Um, but uh, from overall, from a COVID standpoint and the investor standpoint, uh, we actually ended up doing quite well during this period, which is a nice thing. Yeah, a lot of leaders that I talked to, like yourself, it was unknown territory, yeah. and the best we could do is be transparent and say, look, right. we don't know. This is all uh, front page news for all of us. We're gonna get through it together. Um, and in hindsight, a lot of leaders I talked to said that they really, as you just alluded to, are, are flexing the empathy muscle. Yeah. Any other leadership traits that you've noticed in yourself yeah. that have either developed or been magnified as a result of this? Well, one thing that was really quite interesting that came out of it was obviously when we were locked down everyone was dispersed and no one was together and so people were losing a sense of connectivity you could have a zoom call to, to pull people together but it's not the same as being in person and so it was proposed to me like why don't you do a video to first of all reach out to our students reach out to our our employees and our faculty to kind of to tell them what's going on because all of a sudden we're all working from home and I've now continued that because I got such a strong response whereby I, I, I realized, you know, lots of times a CEO, you're, you're going to give direction to individuals and like the game of telephone, every layer it goes down to, the direction can get lost. Now I realized I had a direct channel to all my employees. I've always had it, yeah. but I'd never thought about it before. So now every two weeks, I do a little five minute video, might be talking about a school, might be talking about a student, might be talking about a program, but to just educate them on the organization that they're a part of and also tell them exactly what are we doing, why are we doing it? And if there's a major initiative I want to make sure everyone knows about, I'll talk about that. And now I don't have, uh, I have just a much more direct line of communication. Um, now, not everyone watches my videos course, all the time. Yeah. Uh, I do uh, know that uh, it's unfortunately lower than I would like, like maybe 40% um, watch it consistently. But I'm trying to improve it, just like you're trying to improve and get more people to watch your show. I'm trying to get more people to watch my videos. Well, having you on the program will certainly do that. And once they know that you're a celebrity now, ah. I'm sure they're going to tune in. <laughs> uh, for folks who want to know more about you or Lincoln Tech, Scott, sure. how can they find you? Again, I can be reached at uh, S. Shaw, so S-S-H-A-W at lincolntech.edu. Uh, that's probably the best way to send me an email and I'll be sure to uh, respond. 
Great. We're getting down to the short strokes here. I just got right. the five-minute warning sign, so okay. we're coming close to the end. But you just alluded to when you do your videos, you're talking to your team about future initiatives. Yep. Anything you can share with the audience in general about what to expect? What's the future for Lincoln Tech look like? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is expand our footprint because we have a lot of, I'll say, Fortune 500 companies that want to come to us. And we're a good resource for them because we have scale. Uh, you know, obviously community colleges are a very nice alternative, but community colleges are more like a department store trying to serve a very broad audience with a broad array of programs, whereas we're more like the specialty retailer, very focused. And so if you need technicians, if you need people that work with your hand, there are very few places where large companies can go and we offer a one-stop shop because we have campuses across the country very much focused with having volume coming through our programs. If you need to hire 150 people to be electricians for, let's say, Johnson Controls, one of the companies that we partner with, we work very closely with them and, and help them. So we're trying to build out more relationships with, that, with individuals like that. We just started a partnership with Tesla out in Denver uh, for our automotive program. So students graduate from our automotive program and then go through a spe specialized Tesla program as Tesla employees and then go work for Tesla and we're looking to replicate that. So I think what you'll hear more from Lincoln is hopefully opening up more campuses in more markets to build out this network of skilled trade professionals. Yeah, and you've certainly demonstrated, like in the case with uh, the electric vehicles, as yep. uh, technologies emerge, yes. you're involved in that. So fair to say as the continuing as technology continues to evolve and new industries emerge or nuances that you'll be at the forefront of that as well? That is our intent. I mean, we actually started because back in 1946, two techno new technologies were automatic transmissions and air conditioning. And that's what we started training World War II vets on as, as they came back to get them back into the civilian workforce. So that trend, frankly, is just accelerating with technology. Got it. Scott, unfortunately, we are out of time here, but I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Behind the Numbers. Great. I enjoyed the conversation. Pre appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And thank you for watching and listening. We've been talking with Scott Shaw today, the CEO of Lincoln Tech. Definitely check them out. If you're a parent or a student and you're contemplating what's next for you after high school, definitely give them a look. They're a great alternative. Uh, again, my name is Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the person that my clients turn to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. You can find me on LinkedIn, and I'm always happy to have a conversation. Hit the subscribe button so you can stay in touch with us and know when that next episode drops. And until it does, take care, everybody. We'll see you next time on Behind the Numbers.